Hi, everyone. Welcome to Wine.com Experiences. I'm Gwendolyn Osborne. Uh, we're so excited that you are here joining us today to talk about three incredible South American wines with three amazing South American winemakers uh, from three unique countries. Uh, thank you to everyone who submitted some questions beforehand. We definitely took those into consideration and kind of have put them through our conversation today. So hopefully we'll get all those questions answered. If you did purchase the wines ahead of time, fantastic. Go ahead and get those open. Please get them into some glasses if you can. Uh, don't feel obligated to drink all three tonight if that's a little bit too much. Um, as all of our videos do, this one will also live on on the wine.com YouTube channel. So you can revisit that anytime you are ready to um, taste the, the other wines that you don't get to, whatever works for you. Also, if you are looking for more detailed tasting notes, we are gonna get through these wines and taste through and talk about them. But if you want a little bit more, please feel free to check them out on wine.com. Our tasting pages or our wine pages are chock full of information, tasting notes and critic reviews and maps and sometimes videos. So lots of things to help you get uh, the most out of learning about these wines. Speaking of wines, the wines we are tasting today in order are the Erasuris Max Reserva Carmenere, uh, the Catena Malbec from Argentina, Carmenere from Chile, uh, the Malbec from Argentina, and Bodega Garzon Reserve Tanat from Uruguay. And now let us introduce uh, these three incredible winemakers we have joining us. Eduardo Chadwick from uh, Max uh, from Irazuris in Chile, uh, Dr. Lara Catena from Argentina, from Catena Winery, and Christian Wiley from Bodega Garzon in Uruguay. Welcome to you all. Thank you all for being here. Excited Thank to have you. you. Hello. Gracias. Hello, hello. Welcome um, to Glendalin. Thank you. Yes, thank you. We're excited for you to be here and sharing your wines and, and talking about the stories. I love Hola, Laura. Buenas noches. Yes. Hola, Cristian. Hola, Eduardo. ¿Qué tal, Laura? ¿Qué tal, Eduardo? Hi, Gwendolyn. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, I, I took French. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Uh, bonjour. Bonjour! <laughs> Buenos dias! I do know that. Um, no, um, and gracias for, for being here. I love that we're not only showcasing like a region, but we're kind of showcasing a continent here. Um, and South America is such a unique place with kind of such a rich history, not only um, with wine, but with, with so many things. Uh, so I thought we would start with just kind of a little brief geography lesson, if you will, kind of a geography winemaking combo lesson to uh, for each country from all of you. And, and Christian, I was going to start with you because I think many people are familiar with Chile and Argentina producing wine, but they might not be as familiar with Uruguay. It's a bit of a newcomer for the international wine scene. Um, so, you know, you're, you're planting grapes in Uruguay. Where are you finding the best uh, spots for viticulture there? Um, thanks very much. Uh Uruguay is, is a small, small country um, in, with, uh, that borders with uh, the very big players of, of, of soccer of South America, Brazil to the north and Argentina to the west. We are on the Atlantic coast. We're in the same latitude south, 34 south. So um, they've been producing wine for, uh, for about two or three centuries with uh, some French varietals since, uh, since the mid 19th century. Historically, the vineyards have been in the south center and the west of the south part of Uruguay, near, near Montevideo, near the River Plate. Uh, Uruguay shares uh, tango with Argentina. Uh, a lot of people claim that it started in Uruguay because of Carlos Gardel. I've never heard sure, that. Laura will, will disagree. <laughs> no, no. But, um, <laughs> this reminds me of the Pico have a tango Argentina. challenge, but... The, the beauty of Garzón, of, sorry, of, of Uruguay, it's, it, it's, it's small, but it's, it's full of character. And uh, the Uruguayans are seriously passionate about soccer. It's a country that has, has won more America's Cups in soccer. So there's a there's very, very uh, certain attitude to, to the Uruguayans. They're, they're considered a little bit of the, the Switzerland or the most European country in, in South America, very stable economy, very stable politically, and uh, very, very famous for the beef. Uh, Uruguay doesn't have a very big, very big population. So basically, for every Uruguayo, there's uh, Uruguaya, there's uh, four cows. So masters in asado and grilling, 
a very, very important beef producing country. And also it's famous for its beaches uh, on the Atlantic coast called Punta del Este, where, where I am now, and a little quaint town called Jose Ignacio, which is like the Saint Tropez of South America. Uh, this is where the new vinification, the new regions are, uh, of vineyards have started. It's uh, basically a new 21st century terroir that Garzon has created this new wine region, if you like, close to the Atlantic, cool climate, with uh, much more similarities to Bordeaux and Galicia. So I, I went to university, I studied winemaking in, in UC Davis. I've made Carmener in Chile and Malbec in Argentina. And I can tell you Uruguay is very different, it's much more uh, in the lines of Bordeaux or, or, or Bulgari. So you'll find wines with very nice natural acidity uh, that are now coming to, to become very, very well known also for travel and luxury. It is off the beaten path, but um, we're, coming, we're coming in pretty strong. Yeah, that's great. I can't, we'll, we'll talk more about that when we uh, start to taste the wine. Um, Eduardo, uh, Chile, um, which I have, I have been able to visit, uh, Uruguay is next to my list. But the, the, you know, you've got this very long, uh, you know, narrow country, but it has such interesting influences from North and South and East and West that kind of really make a difference and an impact on the diversity of, of grape growing. Why, why do you think Chile's geography just kind of helps it in its, its wine growing potential? Well, I normally call Chile, describe Chile as a viticulture paradise. It, as it's mentioned, it's very long and narrow. In the north, we have the desert, which is at the four natural barriers. The desert in the north, the Pacific Ocean with very cold waters to the, to the west. To the east, we have the Andes Mountains. And then to the south, we have the glaciers. So these four barriers have kept Chile as a viticulture paradise without no diseases, no pests. We have no phylloxera. And also we have very dry summers uh, that are hot and sunny. So we have a very healthy conditions for, for growing uh, our wines uh, organically or sustainable or even biodynamically. And then in winter time, we have uh, the rainfall, the snow, good for skiing in the Andes. Um, and then in the summertime, that, that snow will melt. And we have, in our case, a, we are in the Aconcagua Valley, a beautiful valley just in the midsection of Chile, just north of Santiago. So these are the key elements that define Chile's uh, weather conditions and terroir. Terroir, as you mentioned, is a very long and narrow country. We have a beautiful source of, of great uh, gravel. Or, or, or more silty or more volcanic origins. So it's really the key is to choose where you plant the vineyards to have these ideal conditions. Uh, climatically speaking, we are, I would say, perhaps between Bordeaux and Napa. Uh, we, our climate is difficult to generalize, but if we talk about Aconcagua Valley or Maipo Valley, we, we, our climate is not as hot as in the core of Napa Valley, but perhaps a little bit warmer than in, or we have a longer season compared to Bordeaux. So the, the beauty here is that we can produce wines that have great balance and great elegance. And I think that's what epitomizes Chile, wines that have the, the nice uh, fruity concentration and wines of, but then of great balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, the, you've been around long enough. I feel like there's such a great uh, connection of which grapes grow well in which place now that that's, become um, kind of helping, I guess, uh, some of the just top quality wines coming out of there are just amazing. Yeah. Now, so. In the past, there were three, four regions. Today, there are 20. Yeah. Yeah. You have different, in the coastal plains or in the northern desert in Atacama or in the south in, 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 the, in the fjords. So there's really, there's been a big, big development uh, very much in line with the development of exports over the past yeah. 20 years. Exciting, exciting. Okay, Alara. Uh, um, exciting time. We're gonna hop over the Andes. Um, into Argentina. I um, kind of want to talk a little bit, if you could just kind of give us a little bit of uh, information on why you think Argentina's geography makes it so well suited for grape growing. Thank you, Wendland. Thank you also for putting me last so I can set the record straight here. <laughs> so, uh, Are we going to talk tango and soccer again? <laughs> uh, so, you know, the one thing I will give to my, my colleagues, my dear friends, Christian and Eduardo, because, you know, we see each other all over the world where we're tasting our wine. So we're great friends is that they have better beaches uh, than Argentina by far. 
Uh, and Brazil might have the best beaches, uh, although I think you, you could compete with Brazil. But if we talk about football, I want to be grateful that there's no Brazilian <laughs> wines in this tasting because I can declare we have the, the, the best soccer team uh, among the ones that are here today. And since I'm last, they don't get to... Ah, Christian! <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about this at the next day. We, we yeah, can yeah. talk about the last, the, the, the last uh, America's yeah, yeah, Cup. Yeah, I, I don't talk about the last one. No. Uh, anyhow, uh, it's so, it's so Short much memory, fun. Short memory, Laura. This is, yeah, I, yes. I only remember what I like to remember. That's what my husband says. Um, but anyhow, I, I think what's, what's really fun about this tasting today, and um, you know, thank you for organizing this, uh, Wine.com and, and Gwendolyn, is uh, that really uh, Chile, uh, Argentina, and Uruguay make such incredibly different wines. I mean, I actually think our regions are more different than Bordeaux and Burgundy, you know, because, you know, um, Chile and uh, Uruguay have this ocean influence and Argentina, uh, the wine country, Mendoza, which is where 70% of the wines are made, but there's also vineyards all the way north and all the way south, is marked by the Andes Mountains. Uh, the Andes Mountains were formed, you know, 100 million uh, years ago, a little over that when these two plagues, uh, you know, um, chocaron, they, they crashed against each other and started going up. And 40 million years ago, you know, the, the oceans reside, uh, the, the Andes go up and you have these glacier covered mountains. Then as the ice ages, uh, you know, start, it starts warming, the, the ice starts melting, these rivers form. And, it, it, and basically my region is formed over millions of years through these alluvions, these, these rivers and glaciers dragging down stones. And that creates these incredible alluvial soils filled with limestone and these gigantic stones that are very well drained. And this is why the wines are, are, tend to be very concentrated because you know, these are poor soils and poor soils make great wine. Uh, and in terms of the temperature, it, it is marked by the altitude. So if you're in France, and you're trying to go from a temperature, you know, warmer, like, uh, you know, in the south, in the, in the Chateau neuf du Pape, all the way to Champagne, you have to drive for about six, seven hours. In Argentina, you can go from the warmer regions to the very cool regions, you know, as cold as Burgundy or Champagne in under an hour. So you have these microclimates where you have different soils and different altitudes, so different temperatures. So you have all these little microclimates, even within the same vineyard. Uh, different flavors. And I think this is what really marks Argentina is this mountain climate with very intense sunlight, uh, cool climate at the high altitudes, a little warmer further down, but incredible uh, diversity. And, and really, I, I do think that this is so fun today because each one of these countries has such different flavors. And I think often people put us like we're similar. But actually, what's fun about our three countries is that our wines are so different. Yeah, and we're gonna, yes. Um, well, let's, that's a good point. Let's taste them. Okay, we're ready to, to taste. And we're gonna start with the Carmenere. Um, so the Razeris Max Reserva Carmenere. Um, so Eduardo, uh, Vina Razeris has a history of nearly 150 years old. Mm -hmm. You are sixth generation. Um, that's amazing. That's fantastic. Um, so here's where we are. We're, we're here in Chile. Um, you know, Tell us a little bit about the history of this winery and maybe just kind of kind of the evolution of this winery. Here we are. I think this is the old winery and the new winery and kind of how far it's come. Yeah. Well, the old winery was founded back in 1870 by Don Maximiano Erasuris. So it was really six generations back the new one that in was. those Sorry. days. And he found it in the beautiful Aconcagua Valley. That's the origins. And like many other Chileans that went to Bordeaux and brought the Catholics, that was the beginning of the fine wine uh, production in Chile in the 1850s, 1870s. Uh, but in those days, most of the wines were drunk in Chile. Uh, I joined the winery in 1983. My father invited me to join at the beginning of the development of exports. So that was the, the, the real change in Chile's mindset and attitude towards to was really producing world-class wines. My first trip was to Bordeaux to learn more the intricacies of fine winemaking. And then I started traveling and started really fine tuning. And our, uh, our Max wine and our philosophy has always been the philosophy of terroir. Having, we have different vineyards in the, in the Aconcagua Valley from the coast inland. 
and uh, the, the, the picture you were showing is the Don Maximiano state, which is facing the old uh, winery. And then we have seven plots that are called the Max. And this Max Carmenere comes from, from one of these. So this has been the, the history of the winery. And from the beginning, we have tried to put Chile in the map in the fine wine. I think Chile has been known since, uh, since for the past 30 years more as really very nice drinking wine, affordable wines. But uh, the philosophy of Vigna Rassuri was to really demonstrate that we could put our wines at the top in the company of the best regions of the world to place Aconcagua and Maipo Valleys amongst uh, Napa, Bordeaux, and the key wine region. So that has been my, my, my mission, I would say my, my vision, but I've been trying very hard. And there are many milestones. Some of them are the, the, the Berlin tasting where we proved that our wines were amongst the top wines of Bordeaux and Italy. And I have one picture that I want to share with you today. Oh, yes. Yeah. That I think, it, because I'm very proud of it. And also because I have my dear friend, Laura there. So in here, <laughs> you can see Laura and me receiving the uh, Robert Parkey Extraordinary Winery Award a few years ago. So Laura, this is to you. That's why uh, I'm, I'm showing it. You look beautiful. Salud, I'm <laughs> drinking your wine and it's fantastic. Yeah. And I've got Christians know. lined up. I know, La Laura's lucky. She's got all three of the wines lined up, but I know you're all very yes. each other's wines, yes. So Vinyarasis and Zapata were selected that year as the best of, of, of uh, South America. Mm -hmm. So, but that's the philosophy that we have. That's what we've been trying to do, to put Chile at the highest level of quality and, and recognition. Uh, uh, today, we're tasting Carmenere, yeah. and Carmenere is a great variety yeah. that... Wait. Wait, tell me how to pronounce it, I'm sorry. I guess I say Carmenere, and you say it so much better. What? <laughs> well, in Spanish, we call it Carmenere, but it's Carmenere yeah, or Carmenere. Okay. Yeah. I've seen so many, yeah. But it, it's a great variety that's native from Bordeaux. Mm -hmm. in, in the, it really, it, it was really planted and it was part of the Lafitte, the Mouton, the top wines of Bordeaux, always had a percentage of Carmenere. But then Europe was, the, the vineyards were destroyed by Phylloxera. Yeah. And that was the time when, and the, the vineyard won't never replanted Carmenere because it's perhaps one of the most difficult grape varieties to grow. It suffers from colure and it needs a lot of sun to ripen. It's, but it was just the case that Don Maximiano and a few other producers brought these cuttings to Chile. And today we have Carmenere amongst uh, Cabernet, Merlot. You can see the leaf is very distinctive. Beautiful. It turns red when it's yeah. ready to be, to be harvested. And uh, the, uh, it's a long growing season that is ideally suited for the Aconcagua and Maipo and Colchagua valleys because we have a long, hot, sunny days and you need to, it's the last grape variety to ripen. And mm -hmm. it's a beautiful wine that has a very, very deep color because it's a really intense. Mm -hmm. um, it's a wine that has really full of spices and it's a full body with uh, black cherries and, and black fruits, a bit of olives. Mm -hmm. Oh, I get the olives. Mm -hmm. And then in the mouth, it's really very, silky it's like a really long fine very very fine tannins and you have a bit of a, a bit of black cherries licorice dark chocolate spices um but all really wrapped in a real velvety uh, body so it's really very very long and and easy i mean and nice to to the palate um and it's a, a very rich time, style and ripe Yep. I was saying for a long time it was mistaken as Merlot, correct? Until the, the somewhere we in the 1990s? Had an, or we the, had an ampelographer, uh, Jean-Michel Boursicot, that came in, uh, in uh, 1994. And at the time, the Carmenere was, uh, I mean, no one understood that we had Carmenere. So it was more, it was sort of a Chilean Merlot. But once we, we understood what was all about, we planted in the right soils which it, Carmenere needs more uh, clay and heavy soil is, to really resist at the end of the season uh, so that it, it needs some, some time to ripen. So I, I think today Carmenere, it's a, it's a beautiful grape variety to taste by itself, like with uh, Max, this is a Max rate, 100% uh, varietal wines, but also we use it in our top blends. 
Mm -hmm. We find Caminere blended into Don Maximiano, our flagship wine, or also you will find it in Seña, which is which was, was our joint venture with Robo Mondavi. So the top blends from Chile will normally have a proportion of Cabernet Sauvignon and Carmenere, which will give the spiciness, the extra edge. It's really a, a beautiful wine and a beautiful wine by itself or as a component. Yeah, it's just, it's a very unique grape and I'm, it's exciting that it's been and done this been, And the vintage that we're showing is vintage 2018, mm -hmm. which has been considered one of the very best, it was a very balanced vintage, uh, very uh, normal temperatures, but very sunny, very nice hot summer and autumn. And it allowed the wine to really have a very, very round, uh, full bodied and right, nice maturity, but also with good freshness, with good acidity, and that it gives the wines a very fresh and uh, a lively palate. Yeah, it, it's very well balanced and it does have, have all of those things, the brightness and um, I'm excited because we're we're grilling. So these are like, I'm excited about all these wines later when we, when we grill. So thank you, Eduardo, for, for sharing. Um, Laura, let's, let's move on to uh, the Catena. So Catena has made such an impact, I think, on the industry just for promoting the quality of, of Argentina wines, both Malbec and others. Um, you're kind of a part of a, a wine dynasty. Can you tell us a little bit about the Catena family? Just, you know, your vision over the past, you know, 100 plus years. So our, our family was founded in 1902 by my great grandfather, Nicola Catena. This is um, my father and me walking in the vineyard. I've been working with my father since um, the mid nineties because my, my first life was a, as a physician and I practiced as a physician and as a, a winemaker for 30 years. Um, but working with my father is, is just the greatest gift. Um, and uh, I'm the first woman uh, to lead our family winery because it was always the guy to the guy to the guy. And I am very happy when I see Eduardo and his daughters because I, I think he's also a very lucky man that he has these beautiful daughters that work with him. And it, it just makes me so happy to, to see that there's now daughters, you know, coming along and, and working in their family wineries. Um, but really, uh, so my great grandfather came from Italy, like many immigrants who came to who came to Argentina and, and the, the wine production in Argentina, which started in the 15th century, is very much marked by these immigrants. Argentina is the fifth largest producer of wine in the world. Before you started seeing Argentine wine in the 1990s in the US, the reason you didn't see more wine was that we were drinking it all because we drink wine right. in Argentina the same way they drink wine in Spain and Italy because uh, you know, 6 million Europeans came to Argentina. 70% of Argentines have Italian descent. There's also many uh, people of Spanish descent. And one of these people was my great grandfather who came to Mendoza specifically to plant his own vineyard. And, and what you showed with, with the beautiful Andes Mountains, he fell in love with that. My, grandpa, my grandfather continued making wine. And my father really had a, an inspiration in California. We we left Argentina during the military government. My father was, you know, going back and forth. It, it was pretty crazy in Argentina. You know, you know, when Christian said uh, Switzerland, it is true. Both Chile and Uruguay, maybe more Uruguay even, have more stable economy and politics than Argentina. We are kind of a crazy country. Uh, <laughs> um, we're very passionate. Um, we're great in many ways, but um, that's another long story. But, uh, but anyhow. Uh, we left Argentina, we went to California where I continued and ended up going to medical school. Um, but my father uh, was inspired by the Californians at that time who after the judgment of Paris were saying, hey, we can make wines that can stand with the best of the world. Mm -hmm. And he went back to Argentina and he said, I'm gonna try and do this. And if you ask my father about it, he says, you know, honestly, Laurita, he calls me Laurita, I just got lucky because I could have gone back to Argentina and maybe we didn't have the right climate, the right soil, but I got lucky uh, because we did have this beautiful mountain climate and this Malbec variety uh, that uh, like Carmenier, uh -huh. is also very famous in France. It's, it's a 2000 year old grape. Um, it dates back to when the, the Romans went through France. It was actually more widely planted in Medoc, where the most famous Grand Cru's uh, come from in the 18th and 19th century than Cabernet Sauvignon. But it was very delicate. 
and it didn't like the, the little ice age that they were having. And after phylloxera, it didn't get replanted widely. But fortunately, because otherwise Malbec might have gone extinct. You know, we, we might have had a grape extinction. It came to Argentina in the 1850s where it just did well. It loved the, the mountain soils, the mountain sun. And, you know, for, as my father says, I got lucky. You know, this variety did so well in Argentina. And, um, you know, it's just exciting that because of uh, what my country, what my family has done, we have been able to bring this variety back to life. And today, my, my country is famous for this variety, Malbec, that is so delicious that we're drinking today. And, and I do want to say, I want to make one little toast um, yeah. for my friend, Aviva uh, Zygman, whose husband, uh, she's a doctor, we trained together, and her husband bought her this tasting for her birthday. Aww, so birthday. Aviva, uh, happy birthday. And I'm so happy you're meeting my friends, Eduardo, Christian, and Gwendolyn. Because, uh, you know, happy birthday, Aviva. She's and one of my dearest friends. That's wonderful. And happy birthday to anybody else who's, whose birthday there is. Sometimes, yeah. we get people, sometimes we get people on the on the question to say, it's my birthday. It's my birthday. That's what I got for my birthday. So happy birthday to anybody who's having yes, a birthday. Happy and birthday. So, yes, happy yes. birthday. Yes, and to anybody who got this uh, as a gift. Um, I actually got the little package and I felt like it was my birthday because you know, I, I, I'm drinking Eduardo and Christian's uh, wines, which I drink less often than my own wine. Um, so, you know, it's this beautiful variety that came to Argentina. We are a very wine drinking culture. It's, it's the national beverage of Argentina, wine. So we drink wine with lunch and dinner. I mean, sometimes just with dinner. Um, and, uh, and this Catena Malbec uh, is very, uh, I call it our Chanel number no. five because we work really hard to make wow. this wine perfect every year. It's a blend from three different altitudes, but the Masal selection planted in these vineyards is pre phylloxeric So it came to Argentina before phylloxera. So it's very uh, diverse. It has these small, very small bunches. This kind of Malbec does not exist. In, in France or in the old world anymore. They, they mostly planted uh, more productive Malbec. And so I actually like to say that for Malbec, Argentina is actually the old world because we plant our, our vines ungrafted like they do in Chile, uh, you know, without American rootstocks. And we have these plant selections that have been lost in Europe. Uh, the wine is, is, um, has a, a beautiful, you know, a little mix of black and red fruit. It has some violet florals that come from the cool climate and the high altitudes. Uh, Malbec is very, very rich, but always has a smooth palate. If you, if you taste it, you get a great concentration, but there's nothing bitter about the wine or astringent. And that is why it was always blended with Cabernet Sauvignon in Bordeaux, because the Cabernet was so tannic, it needed the Malbec. But in Argentina, it makes a, a very beautiful complex wine on its own. Yeah, no, this is this is beautiful, and I know that that you and Eduardo both do both take Carmenere. Like Eduardo was saying, he has the Sena, which was a partnership with Robert Mandavi. You have uh, Caro. Caro. Yeah, we have a partnership Caro. with uh, oh, Rocha oh. Lafitte. Yeah, which we tasted with Saskia about a month ago. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I love that the Cabernet is still important in all of these yeah. these areas. There's, and there's another woman making history, Saskia. The yeah, there you go. There you go. That's all about the. I have three daughters. I'm all about the daughters. Let's just. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I actually have. I, I, I have four, so I. <laughs> oh, you beat me. Okay, you win. <laughs> Good luck. Actually, sure, they're already Eduardo, in the business. Eduardo, yeah. did you know that men who have three or more daughters live five years more than men who don't have three or more daughters? Well, I'm going to live 20 years more, five per each of them. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. Just more gray hair, but you'll live longer. Anyway, well, this is, I mean, yeah, this is beautiful. I love the texture of, of Malbec from um, Argentina and the kind of rich, that berry, that cherry, the plum, the, the almost sometimes there's a chocolatey note that I really like that comes through. Yes, there is always, and, but you know what? That is not coming from the oak. If, if you have unoaked Malbec, you still get that. Okay. It's, yeah. it's, it's typical of the variety. Yeah. That's beautiful. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. We love this wine. Um, okay, we're going to try some Tanat from Uruguay. So Christian, um, we're moving into Uruguay. I want to talk a little bit about inspiration for the, the winery. Um, you know, this is Bodega Garzon. Um, it's kind of the most well-known. I think you've done an amazing job of just getting Uruguay wine 
here into the states you know it's it's why it's available people can find it they can see it here's your gorgeous winery it's on my list now to visit um but what was kind of the inspiration behind bodega garzon oh thank you very much uh, for 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 you we just said um it's 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 wonderful uh pretty much virgin territory what you see on the picture on the horizon is the atlantic ocean okay. and going back to what i was saying that's right where uh, Punta del Este and Jose Ignacio beaches are. Uh, is the reason why I'm, I am in Uruguay. I married a lady from Uruguay, my wife. So I also have to deal with women and my hair is not just white, but it's long. <laughs> um, but it, takes, it takes a little bit of patience. But um, if, you, if you can put back that picture one sec. Okay. Um, there we go. So basically what happened was uh, on on the on the this this Riviera of South America, Jose Ignacio is part of the Garzón municipality. Inland, just ten miles, you have the little town of Garzón, uh, which was became very famous because Francis Malman went there and opened up his his go-to you know uh, foodie foodie lovers uh, restaurant, and and Mr. Bulgeroni, who is actually from Argentina, uh, like most Argentinians, go on holidays to Punta del Este and Jose Ignacio invested very heavily in Garzón, first of all, for olives, to making extra virgin olive oil, which is spectacular. It's called Colinas de Garzón, which was, you can see there, the little hills. And he's, he's a very important businessman in the energy sector. And he bought this, this hill, uh, uh, basically, basically a granite rock, a boulder for, for windmills. And his wife, Bettina, uh, kind of told him, you're not gonna put windmills, windmills there, it's the view of the house. So, you know, this very domestic romantic conversation <laughs> ended up in him asking his agronomist, uh, what, can, what can I grow in this, you know, massive boulder of rock with a spectacular uh, uh, biodiversity with beautiful forest and, and uh, uh, capivaras and ostriches, it's just very, very lush. And uh, the agronomist said, well, sir, the only thing that can survive there facing the Atlantic, facing south, the winds uh, grow on the granite rock is probably uh, vines. And then Alejandro interviewed some of the top uh, winemakers around the world and he hit it off really well. He had some great chemistry with El Dr. Alberto Antonini, who came to spend Easter in, in Garzón in 2007. And he realized, uh, you know, you have the latitude 34 south, the sunlight of, of, for the premium wine belt over the Southern Hemisphere. You have cool climate, maritime influence from the Atlantic. Um, you have the granite rock, you have the biodiversity. So he basically told an Alejandro, yeah, you could, you could do wine, let's do a little trial. And Mr. Bulgaroni said, hey, uh, I don't have time. I mean, I'm already in my mid sixties. So let's, I asked you to tell me if I can make good wine. And this is basically the result. What you saw in the pictures, it's literally an experiment. Uh, it's a new wine region. It's a new appellation. Uh, we're alone. There were no vines there. And it's the first uh, crop uh, cultivated. It's, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's very different in a sense from the new world, places like California or, or Chile or Argentina that are mostly dry climates. Here we have uh, uh, more than a thousand millimeters of rain. So you really need the ocean breeze to dry out the rain and you really need the percolation from, from the granite rock. Uh, those things gave uh, this perfect combination for, for Garzón. And very early on, we started seeing amazing results, very round wines, very fruity, very juicy, easy to drink. And then Alejandro um, got uh, really enthusiastic. He's a brilliant visionary and engineer and he built uh, Bodega Garzón. It's, uh, it's an in incredible investment. It's the first facility in the world LEED certified. Like, like family is one of the pillars of, of Mr. Bulgaroni's uh, Bodega Garzón with long-term quality commitment uh, to premium wines and luxury like, like the Chadwick and Rasuri's family and, and uh, the Catena. But he also, it's very much about sustainability. So it's a massive commitment uh, where we have 7,000 square meters, 70,000 square feet of, of green roofs, 
where we treat the, the, the water and we control the temperature. All the vinification is as sustainable as it gets in the vineyards. There's no chemicals or synthesis. The concrete tanks, or the concrete vats are used for fermentation. So everything state of the art, including another very important pillar for us, uh, which you guys are starting to, to promote is the experiences, the destination. Mm -hmm. Wine is all about feeling and people and passion and, and, and place. So we express the place being very respectful and sustainable. And then we invite people to visit uh, and, exper and experience this amazing uh, beach that we have for St. Ignacio with top gastronomy. And then inland, just 10 miles away, these vineyards that are gorgeous and you have uh, a facility where uh, in the winery there's, uh, according to the Cantor magazine from UK, it's the best restaurant in a winery in the world. That's the restaurant at Bodega Garzón and it's directed by Francis Malman as well. Okay. So there's, there's this constellation of very important uh, visionaries and, and then <laughs> a winemaker, uh, <laughs> but I actually have to give all the credit to the Uruguayan team and the vineyards, it's Eduardo Felix. Uh, as you saw in the photo, it's, it's very large and it's also very detailed. There's more than 1,200 parcels. It's this patchwork, it looks a little bit like Tuscany. And it's, it's very, very difficult to make wine in, in, or to grow grapes in a, in a vineyard like that. And then, and then you have a very super talented young winemaker from Uruguay called Germán Brussone. So there's, there's a beautiful terroir combination in, in, in Garzón. Sorry, that was a little long, but... Uh... Okay. <laughs> well, I want to taste the wine and talk a little bit about just Tanat in Uruguay and kind of the intended style behind this wine, because usually people don't go out and look for Tanat on a regular basis. You know, it comes from Southwest France, um, but it, it sometimes is more of a difficult grape to kind of appreciate because it can be a little bit... Well, you know... ...and everything, we... but I mean, this... Why? I mean, it's just, this is amazing. So kind of talk about how Tanat expresses itself in, in this wine, in Uruguay. Yeah, I mean, I, I love challenges, thank God, because, you know, getting to the States with a wine from Uruguay that's a Tanat, it's like, you know, <laughs> what I'm talking about. The important thing is to taste it. As you mentioned, Tanat is also a French varietal. It's not, it's not necessarily from Bordeaux, it's from, it's from Madiran, a little south from Bordeaux. And it's, it's known for, for being a tannic wine, kind of rustic, and you need to age it like 10, 10 years to be able to approach it. It's actually pretty cool when you look at the label in the bottle, you, have, uh, you, can, you can see Tanat is actually a palindrome. So it's, it's friendly for, for selfies and for Instagram live. <laughs> you can read it both ways. Mirror. But uh, obviously the name comes from tannins, from tannic. Mm -hmm. it, came, it came to Uruguay in the 1850s. And I think it's a little bit of a survival of the fittest where every single year you can get good wines out of Tanat. But also in Uruguay traditional regions, it was still a little, you know, tannic. Here in Garzón, we have been able to tame those tannins because of, as I mentioned, the, the, the beautiful natural acidity, the wind coming from the ocean on the hillsides facing north. We get enough sun to ripen the grapes properly. We you got to be careful to pick when the when the seeds are lignified that they'll, they'll be crunchy when you when you bite them and and that means that you won't have too many green tannins uh, great grapes have a, a maximum of four seeds tanat always has four seeds so you need to pick at the right time the beauty of having so much concentration and polyphenols it is actually one of the red grapes that has has most uh, polyphenols out there and it's it's the one that they talked about in the French paradox people in the south of France eating you know duck and foie gras and you know French fries or freedom fries but they were healthy they didn't have any heart disease problems Tanat has 2.2 times more resveratrol than Cabernet Sauvignon so for all the ladies out there uh, that are, are super important uh, and super focused about health Drink Tanat tonight because it will get your skin better. It will look after the health of your husband and you'll live longer. Some people say Tanat gives boys as kids, but I'm, I don't, I'm not sure about that. But basically what you find in this, class, what, what you find in, in this Tanat Reserva, which is doing, is doing really well, 
-hmm. is a wine that has beautiful balance. Uh, there is a lot going on. It's a big boy, but it has, it's very fresh. It's very vibrant. There's a natural, very natural acidity, which is not the case necessarily on the, on the drier climates. And it drinks very nicely. I actually have the 2018 bottle here. Some people in some the states have the 18, the 17. Um, but it's a wine that is not harsh, it's not tannic, it's just very round, very velvety. There's, there's tremendous color. And when we when we vinify, when we ferment in in the in the cement tulips, it means that you have uh, micro oxygenation from the start. So we actually cold soak to, to extract all the aromas and, and the color. And you have the polymerization of tannins and anthocyanins very early on. So very, very round, fresh, vibrant, long finish. And you can feel it makes your mouth water. And that's when I, I mean that it's the wines are a little bit more European in that sense. They have this beautiful freshness. Yeah. And if it does uh, have, I mean, it's not overly tannic, but I get the structure that kind of makes me like, you know, want to have a juicy steak or something along those lines. Well, that's that was what I was going to say. It's perfect for steak. The, the, the fine tannins will keep your palate clean. The acidity is going gonna, is gonna to cut through the fat. And here in Uruguay, when you barbecue, you know, you basically have to eat the whole animal because there's so many cows per person. But you, you <laughs> keep your palate clean and you can really, I mean, you can taste a great steak or a great ribeye with this wine. Yeah. And I think uh, actually all of these wines probably are, are great for food. I've Absolutely. Um, and when you when you mention the challenges of, of you know, Uruguay and Tanat, we and, and how we've 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 done well in the States, uh, uh, we've been very blessed by by the, the opinion leaders uh, like Wine Spectator is, is that this, this wine has been in the top 100 wines of the world. Uh, wine Enthusiast is best buy 92 points. Uh, James okay. Sacklin just gave this this uh, 2018 uh, 92 points as well. And it's a very young winery, but it's already been in, in, your, in this podium of the New World Winery of the Year. So there's a lot going on, there's tremendous passion, and, and uh, we were very fortunate, uh, we're very lucky to be a small country with not so many people. We haven't, we've already, uh, we don't have any cases of, of, of the virus, coronavirus, oh, wow. in Garzón and Maldonado. There are no new cases in Uruguay, so we, we were quite blessed. Uh, and, and we hope everybody's keeping safe. Yeah. But we, we had a, an amazing, the reason I bring this up, we had an amazing 2020 harvest. Amazing. It was complicated bringing the grapes in and vinifying with a mask and the gloves. And it was, people drink mate here and they share the straw. You got to tell them, no, 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 man, you can't share the straw. And you, 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 as, as Laura was saying, there's mostly Italians, so they kiss. So you yeah. got to stop all these habits. <laughs> but... Uh, we're super, we're super excited and motivated because we always say the best part of Garzón is the future. And in the wineries, in, in the tanks today, we have an amazing 2020 harvest. So we really look forward right. to, to the future. Right, yeah, you all just had your harvest, which is so exciting. Yes. So, um, so yeah, I, I think all the, I mean, I love, and, and Lara, you, you touched on that of just like, these are all so different. I mean, you're all in the same con and you're nearby, but the, the difference of just kind of geography and, and land and grape varieties is kind of, Fascinating and makes it so diverse. So um, thank you guys for being here. I did, I had one uh, last thing and we'll try to make it um, quick, but I kind of, I, I wanna, I, we, we talked a lot about these grapes that are uniquely suited to each of your countries, such as Carmenere, Malbec, Tanat, but I know that you all make a lot of great wines. So I just kind of wanted to get from you like your top two, maybe one or two that you uh -huh. that you love, that you'd love to share. If somebody says, oh, I love this Tanat, what else does Garzon make? So. You know, Christian, I'll, I'll just start with you because I've had your Albarino, I've had your Rosé. Um, what what other variety do you think has, has promised that you love? Well, as, as you mentioned, Albarino is, is beautiful and it's again off the beaten path. It's doing fantastic. On the southern side of the slopes, we get very crispy, very fresh with some saltiness. So it's it equates to, to Galicia. Also in the, the same reserve range with really great value. We're making a point of bringing the wines under $20 in the States for, for you to enjoy. Uh, I, I am very surprised with the quality of Cabernet Franc. 
in, in the estate of, of Garzón, as well as Marcelan. And um, what we have already been able to, to put together is this meritage, which I love. Of, uh, it's called Balasto, which is the name of the meteorized granite. Is this, this bottle of wine here? Oh. Um, Balasto. And this, this is the first wine from Uruguay to make it into the Place de Bordeaux. So it has distribution through Negociants. And it's, uh, it's, a blend, it's a blend of Tanat, Cabernet Franc, Marcelan, and Petit Verdot that it's just delicious. Fantastic. And we'll be able to find that here, right, at some point? You, yeah, you have it. Thank you very oh, yeah. much. Well, I'm sorry, wine.com has it. I also, uh, <clears throat> I love your wine.com hat in the background. That's awesome. Oh. Um, I just noticed that. That's great. Um, okay. Well, yes, I'm going to have to try that. I haven't tried that yet. Um, thank you. Um, Eduardo uh, Razaris, um, you know, I love the Max line. I, I love the Chardonnay. It's one of my favorite value Chardonnays just anywhere. Um, but what else do you love making that reflects Chilean terroir from a great perspective of a, a well, great variety? In terms of great varieties, Chile is 70% red wines and 30% white, which is mainly Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc. We love to produce the reds on the inner valleys, but we also have beautiful coastal plains in the Aconcagua Costa and Casablanca. And that's where, particularly in Aconcagua Costa, we have, uh, we have a cheese soil and we have a beautiful range of Chardonnay and also Pinot Noir. So that's where we have our, our Burgundy a little, uh, little terroir. And, uh, and you have a, a, a Max, under the Max range, we have a Chardonnay and a Pinot Noir. And we also have a range called Pizarras, which means uh, the, the chist. Chist is the, uh, the, the soil. So here the roots go very deep and it's really uh, the soil and climate conditions are really unique for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, which is not what Chile is known for, but I'm, I'm convinced this is going to be the future. But, but uh, and that's perhaps the, uh, a, a, a project we just started back in 2005. But perhaps where Chile is better known, and I think where we are already more established is more into the, the top blends. Um, the, the top blend of our house is uh, Vignero Chadwick, which is a, a wine that I created to honor my father that comes from the Maipo Valley. And this was the first wine to gain 100 points for Chile. So oh, wow. you know, and this was the winner That's of the amazing. Berlin tasting. And of course, the other wine that is a blend is Peña. Uh, yeah. Which yeah. we hope to show perhaps in the future, in the, in the later at, at, with you. Uh, and these two wines represent, together with the Maximian, represent what Chile is the best of Chile, in terms of the, the, the Bordeaux blends. And this is where Chile is gaining more and more track uh, record. It's been, as I said before, the today is traded in La Place de Bordeaux. And these are the wines that are giving Chile the ultimate image and I think the long-term positioning amongst the top, the same would be the top of Napa, or Bordeaux, or, or the top other regions of the world. So uh, this is where Vigna Erasuris with uh, this wine, this is where we are making, I would say, I think we are with, with the wines with which we have changed the perception of Chile to be recognized among the first growth of the world, which was my dream some 30 years ago. Right, working with, that was your goal. And I, I, I had a great mentor working with Bob Bondavi for many years and his family and Tim. And I think this was, there was really a learning experience and going back and forth to Napa and to really then try to, to get this expertise in producing fine wines. That I think is the, uh, what, what makes me very happy looking back. And uh, so it, it's been a wonderful time for recognition for, for top Chilean wine. Good. So, uh, yes, well, I've had but, it before, not very often, but it is a phenomenal, fantastic one. So, <laughs> congratulations. So, thank end. you very much, Wendelin, uh, and to Michael for the opportunity okay. of showing our wines with you. Uh, really. Good. Thank you. Thank and, you. Lara, I was going to, well, let me ask Lara what, real quick before we sign off of um, what are you excited about? I mean, I know that you have a lot of different, I, I know that Malbec's great, but then the Malbec tab lens that you do are amazing. Are there any other varietal wines you're, you're seeing? Well, I think that Chardonnay from high altitude, uh, you know, limestone soils, really cool climate. We have these two wines, white bones, white stones. Um, they consistently, you know, 
Since they, everybody's they, they make bragging, me swoon. They make me swoon. You know that. I, I, I'm going to brag. I like those wines. 99, 100 points for these wines. But still people don't know them um, uh, because we make very little of them. But uh, these wines are, are extraordinary. They have a flavor that I've never tasted before. So I think, I think single parcel wines, kind of Burgundian style for Chardonnay and Malbec from altitude is something that you... Hopefully we'll, we'll see more of from Argentina. There's, there's several other producers making incredible wines in the Uca Valley. Um, I think Monarda, you know, are two sort of native varieties. They're not, well, Torrontes is native native. Uh, it was actually born in Argentina. It's a very aromatic white, comes from mm -hmm. Salta in the north. I think it's one of the best summer whites. Um, it's kind of like our Albariño. Delicious. It's floral, it's very floral. It's so floral, it's beautiful. I highly recommend it. We, we make some. Um, and then Monarda is a variety that came uh, from, from Savoie, uh, which is French, but it used to belong to Italy. So it's kind of French Italian. And this variety blended with Malbec and sometimes alone from old vines. It's, it's really exciting. Um, and, you know, I also think that the, the classic Cabernet Malbec blend, um, which really has disappeared in, in Bordeaux, because mm -hmm. most of Bordeaux does not use a lot of Malbec. But if you think about, you know, the 19th century, 1855, when all those uh, wines were classified, that was the blend. So I call it the original Bordeaux blend. And if there's a French person out there, they, hopefully they can't get to me. Uh, but it is. Um, and and we, we make a wine called Nicolas Catena Zapata, named after my father, that ages really beautifully. And it has that, that richness of the Cabernet with the smoothness of the Malbec and I think it's, it's really delicious. And, and just like, you know, like Eduardo and Christian, I, I think blends from, from Argentina are, are also uh, really exciting. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I thank you all so much for, for joining us to talk about these three wines, about your, your families, about um, the great continent that we have, uh, that's wines coming out of. I love these wines, they're delicious. Uh, for those of you at home who may have tuned in but didn't get a chance to purchase the wines ahead of time, we still have this trio available on wine.com as well as a, a whole host of, of other South American wines that you can kind of dive into and try from Torrentes and Alborino and Chardonnay and Carbonier and Cabernet, all sorts of wonderful, wonderful things um, available. So again, thank you so much um, for sharing South America. I hope that all of your daughters take over the world very soon. Um, but yeah, this is, this is lovely. Yeah, I, have, I have two sons. I know, I know. So, I know. They're, they're, no. they're, Just they're children, I love the family history <laughs> of, of just, no matter what their gender, of teaching, teaching the family, the family wines and having that carry on with a passion. So um, we appreciate, we appreciate that. So thank you very, very thank much. You, thank you very much to all the family of wine.com. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Gwendolyn. You, so much, so much you know, we're, we're used to Eduardo, Christian, and I, we see each other very regularly, but we haven't because we haven't been traveling. So it's yeah. actually really fun That's that true. we get to see each other. Our virtual meeting. Absolutely. Meet. I look yeah. forward to seeing you, yeah. Laura, Eduardo, Christiana, and Gwendolyn. Thank you so much. And Gwendolyn. Cheers. Muchas gracias. Hasta luego. Thank you very gracias. much. Bye bye. Gracias. Bye bye. Gracias. Gracias. Goodbye. Good night. Good Stay night. safe. It's both a science and a form of high art. It's made from the combination of grapes, sunlight, rain, soil, and time. It's raised up in the moments that matter. It's wine. And we are wine.com. We have the largest wine selection in the world, online sommeliers with free advice. And now, our powerful new app puts the entire world of wine in your hands. Wine.com. Seriously passionate about